Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so just before we get started uh, for today's event, I just want to let you know briefly that uh, for those who are joining us in person on your seats, we do have um, some headsets. Uh, if you would like to, at any point, uh, utilize simultaneous interpretation, so English to French, French to English, whichever one um, is comfortable for you. So on channel one is the English channel, and, and then on channel two is the French channel. And then similarly, for those joining uh, virtually, simultaneous interpretation has been enabled um, on the chat. So feel free to utilize um, that service if you would like to. And just to, to get us started off here, I would like to introduce um, our CEO, Khalil Sharif, to give us some opening remarks. Usually the room would erupt into applause at that. Well, that's fine. You know, but I mean, as, as you know, tomato, tomato, tomato. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how, how I'll be when I come to your places, which is fine. It's fine. Uh, well, good morning, uh, uh, everyone, uh, both in the room and online. A real delight to be welcoming you uh, to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamate, which is here in Ottawa on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Uh, those of you who know um, the history of this area will know that for uh, many centuries here in Ottawa, at the place where the three rivers meet, the indigenous people of this um, area had an extraordinary tradition of hospitality. Uh, uh, every year would welcome um, uh, indigenous uh, communities from a very large catchment area, and they would come together here in the spirit of exchange, of exchange of uh, goods and services for sure, but also in an exchange of relationship and indeed in an exchange of ideas. And so in that great tradition uh, established uh, so many centuries ago, we are very delighted to be able to gather here both physically and virtually uh, to explore those issues which might lift our horizons for Canada's role in contributing to a more peaceful and prosperous and pluralist world. Um, Today, we have the very unique honor of being able to launch, um, maybe a few months late, but um, purposeful nevertheless, um, the, uh, this year's UNDP Human Development Report. Um, you will have seen it, I think, in the materials already that the theme of this year's report is navigating uncertainty. Uh, we can debate, uh, probably, if uh, such a characterization of our current situation is astute, or prescient or simply obvious, uh, we cannot debate that it is absolutely and viscerally true and precise, that we are going through a moment uh, in, um, uh, in the world which is marked by very significant and serious change, uh, very rapid developments in technology and the foundations of economic advance on the one hand, uh, tectonic shifts in the way that international actors relate to each other and the patterns of those relationships, um, and maybe a unique level of pressure on the institutions of domestic governance across the world, uh, countries large and small in the north and in the south. Uh, the confluence of all these forces at play is creating extreme demand on our ability to navigate, to predict, to uh, have a sense of how things might unfold. Um, uh, it's requiring us definitely to renovate our ideas, the mental models that we hold that might uh, help us take decisions about, uh, about issues, uh, but it's also putting a lot of stress on the actual practical instruments we have at our disposal to pursue our work. So I'm delighted that uh, UNDP was uh, eager to do this. I want to thank uh, Cooperation Canada and Kate Higgins, uh, who uh, raised this uh, idea uh, with us some, uh, some weeks ago and was ready to work with us to do this. Thanks, Kate, for being such an excellent partner, as always, uh, in this. And of course, Global Affairs Canada, who continues to be an important part of our efforts to convene the sector on issues of, uh, of importance to Canada and the world. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome you all here. Let me thank in advance uh, the panelists for agreeing to uh, contribute to this discussion. I look very much forward to uh, learning uh, from all of you. Over to you, Uju. Thank you. Oh, 
Okay, uh, and just to introduce um, our keynote speaker for today's session, um, I'm going to be introducing Pedro, who is the director of the Human Development Report Office at UNDP. Um, since the 1st of January in 2019, Pedro has been the director of the Human Development Report Office and the lead author of the Human Development Report. Prior to this, he served as the director of strategy policy at the Bureau for Policy and Program Support and Chief Economist and Head of the Strategic Advisory Unit at the, Re at the Regional Bureau for Africa. Before that, he was Director of the Office of Development Studies from March uh, 2007 to November 2009 and the Deputy Director of ODS from 2001 to 2007. We continue to see his work on financing for development and on global public goods, which was published by the Oxford University Press in books that he co-edited. He has published on inequality, the economics of innovation and technological change and development in and amongst other journals. He co-edited several books, including Innovation, Competence Building and Social Cohesion in Europe, towards a learning society. So please, we, uh, please join me in welcoming Pedro as our keynote speaker. Thank you so much, Ruchu, and thank you, thanks to Khalil and to Kate for, for inviting us to this session. My apologies for not being able to be there in person, but my colleague, Heriberto, is in the room. I was able to see him. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to um, uh, uh, the interaction uh, during the panel. Uh, I think Khalil uh, laid out very clearly um, already what we, we tried to capture uh, with this report. So I'll try to give a little bit more detail uh, and color to uh, what um, uh, Khalil already uh, outlined. Um, and I would start perhaps by saying that this might be an unusual report uh, in that um, it, it's really a, a report that tries to, to listen to what people uh, are saying. Many reports uh, are about telling people what they should do, and that's important. Uh, but this was a, a report in which we are trying to listen. Uh, and what we heard was that people around the world were telling us that they are, they are unsettled um, uh, about their lives. Um, in a sense, they did not feel in control uh, of their lives. Um, uh, six out of every seven people, um, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, reported feeling insecure. Um, uh, and this perception of insecurity was actually growing uh, uh, in, in many cases in countries where uh, standards of living and income uh, are very high. Um, uh, and many people were also not hopeful about the future and, and felt that uh, contrary to what we read from many of the objective indicators of well-being, uh, did not see progress in their living standards. About half of the population reported not seeing progress compared to uh, uh, the generation of, of their parents. Um, and so there's just a sense of, of unsettledness that is also reflected in declines in mental well-being and mental health uh, to which we um, actually dedicate a full, a full chapter uh, in the report. But it's not only about um, perceptions uh, and mental well-being. Uh, we're seeing uh, even objective indicators of uh, um, development or progress going in, in, in the wrong direction. Uh, extreme poverty and food insecurity are increasing uh, after many years of, uh, of, of improvements. Um, and these are, are driven in part by losses in income, but also compounded by volatility in energy and food prices. Um, uh, everything in the context of, uh, of a rapidly uh, changing climate. So um, for the first time uh, on record, we saw a, a decline in the Global Human Development Index, which is the uh, metric that we've introduced several years ago that combines um, uh, standards of living and achievements in health and education. Uh, the Global Human Development Index in 2021 is actually at the same level that it was in, in 2016. Uh, and 2016 was a, was a, a, good, a good moment, a, 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 a time of hope. Uh, there was a renewed sense of 
possibility after the Paris Agreement and the SDGs had been adopted uh, just year before. So we, we've gone back um, quite a lot uh, in just two years. Uh, and it's not only uh, that the Global Human Development Index went down, uh, it, it went down um, almost everywhere. Uh, uh, we always see the Human Development Index decline in a, a few countries every year. Um, it declined on about 20% of countries at the time of the global financial crisis. But in 2020 and 2021 actually went down uh, in nine out of every 10 countries. Um, uh, so uh, there's, there's really a, a sense of, uh, of, of unsettledness in people's life that, that we um, can, can gleam, can see, both from what people are, are telling us from, from perception data, uh, but also it's reflected in, in objective indicator, indicators. So uh, wh why, why do we confront this, this context of, of unsettledness? Um, and, and the argument that we put forward uh, is that we, we, we are living in a, in a context where uncertainty is not necessarily higher than it was in the past, but it's acquiring new shapes, new configurations um, in what we call a, a new uncertainty complex. Um, and we uh, describe in particular three layers of uncertainty uh, that are uh, in our view somewhat novel uh, or if not completely new, uh, at least acquiring new forms. So I'll, I'll describe them briefly. Uh, the first uh, is associated with um, uh, what has been described as a, a new planet, planetary reality uh, under the frame of, of this notion, this con concept of the Anthropocene. Uh, and this is manifested in challenges that range from climate change to biodiversity loss. Uh, th this is important to have this, this broader perspective of, of planetary change because it uh, implies that we have to look at interlinked processes um, that uh, do not lead us to uh, um, undertake policies that leave uh, blind spots. So one example is if we uh, move aggressively, as we should, uh, uh, to, to advance electrification as a, as a response to uh, climate change or to advance climate change mitigation, uh, this has implications on material demand, on demand for minerals, um, uh, and this may destroy ecosystems and lead to the violation of human rights in, in, in some parts of the world. So uh, this not only risks deepening inequalities, but um, can generate new threats, uh, including uh, uh, linked to, to health. Um, uh, the evidence suggests that many of the pressures on ecosystems uh, that have been increasing over the last few years are associated with an increase in the frequency of new or emerging uh, zoonotic diseases, diseases that jump from animals to humans. Uh, this century alone, we have seen uh, either a new or re-emerging zoonotic disease on average um, uh, every uh, three years. Um, and COVID-19 may very well have been uh, the latest. So there's just a, a process of dangerous planetary change um, that is uh, new at this scale uh, in, the, in, the, in our history, in, in the history of humanity, and, and even in the evolution of, of the planet. Uh, this is, is compounded and interacts uh, with two other layers of uncertainty. Um, a second layer of uncertainty is the social and economic transformations of the transition to sustainability uh, and the more digital world. Uh, uh, Khalil has already uh, referred to, to this process of, of technological uh, transformation uh, that are bringing about um, a combination of opportunities, certainly, but also threats. There's a lot of social and economic dislocation associated with, uh, with this transition and this um, rapid uh, technological change uh, that is contributing to this um, second layer of, of uncertainty. And then finally, third, um, there's a, a layer of uncertainty associated with, with political polarization. Um, it's not something new, but, but it's acquiring, uh, uh, it seems, uh, new forms. Um, uh, and it connects in particular with the, the point uh, about people feeling, feeling insecure. Um, we document in the report that people that feel more insecure 
and on the one hand to, to trust others less and are also more likely to support uh, politically extreme positions. So um, as we see an increase in, in this perception, in this sense of, of insecurity, uh, we find that global levels of, of trust uh, are at the lowest on record. Um, we find that uh, at the moment, uh, only one out of every three people trans, uh, trust one another. Uh, and that political polarization is also increasing uh, in many parts of the world within uh, and across countries. And this political polarization, these tensions in the limit can, can lead to, to violent conflict, uh, which even before the war in the Ukraine, according to our estimates, uh, was affecting already 1.2 billion uh, people. So not only people living in conflict areas, but those that are affected by the, the spillovers of, of conflict manifested in many different ways, from forced displacement um, to disruptions to, uh, to supply chains and, and volatility in energy and food prices. Um, so um, a, a context of uncertainty seems to uh, harden commitments by people to a group that shares a similar set of beliefs and increase hostility to other groups. So that's why we, we, we are arguing that this context of political polarization, even though political polarization itself is not something new, is, is acquiring new forms uh, in this, um, in, in this um, new context of, of uncertainty. Um, and, and digital technology, that's the part about uh, how these layers of uncertainty interact with one another, um, uh, sometimes makes things even more challenging, uh, contributing to div dividing our societies um, uh, even more. Uh, so uh, this context of uncertainty, uh, in the context of uncertainty, it also seems that people tend to increase support for authoritarian leaders. So all of these uh, features seem to be um, putting our democratic norms and practices uh, under, under stress. Um, making it more difficult for, for people to come together uh, uh, in countries and across countries to address shared challenges, um, precisely at a time when we would need uh, to pursue uh, collective actions uh, um, uh, the most. So um, uh, what, what to do? Um, because the report is not only painting a, a picture of, of gloom, which may be what emerges from what I've said up to now, uh, but actually the report uh, aims or at least aspires to be one of, of hope and possibility. Uh, uh, and, and with uh, the ideas that are expressed in the report about, about what to do, I'll, I'll come to, to the end. Um, uh, the report argues that um, a context of uncertainty can also be um, uh, an opportunity. Uh, and it can, can shift, change uh, reference points about what is possible uh, or desirable, uh, opening uh, opportunities for bold, pro uh, for bold policies um, and even unprecedented breakthroughs. And I, I think the response to COVID-19 uh, with many fits and starts uh, and, and glaring and persisting inequalities in many, in many aspects of both its impact as well as the um, availability uh, and access to some of the um, technologies that were developed to, to mitigate the, the disease um, has indeed provided many examples of this from um, the development of new vaccines uh, to the expansion of social protection uh, to even new social norms that led people to, to change their behavior, the use of masks, social distance, uh, so this shows that social uh, norms um, and, and, and behavior can actually change quite rapidly. It's not necessarily a process of long, uh, drawn-out uh, change, as it's often assumed. Um, but it's, it's difficult, we argue, to harness uh, a context of uh, uncertainty for positive change if people feel threatened. Uh, so um, uh, we... we suggest that it's important to expand policies that would make make people feel um, more secure. Um, and in the realm of policies, we suggest um, what we call the three I's, uh, uh, enhancing investment, insurance, and innovation. So investment above all in people, but also in uh, uh, um, those global public goods like uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, on which we are becoming more and more dependent, 
and uh, more dependent not only because we are inter interdependent uh, as societies, uh, what has been described um, as, as globalization, but also because we share this, this planetary reality uh, uh, that in which we are all embedded and this process of dangerous planetary change that do require uh, uh, global responses. Um, so investment, but also innovation uh, to protect people from the um, ups and downs of uh, a volatile world and perhaps a, a world that is becoming even more uh, volatile. So this implies both market insurance, but also uh, social insurance. And, and in discussion, maybe we can say a few more uh, things about this. And finally, innovation. Um, innovation um, uh, through which we can harness technology to expand what, what people can do. Um, much of the efforts of harnessing new technologies are about uh, finding opportunities to replace people. Um, but uh, technology can also um, uh, enhance demand for, for labor, demand for work. Um, uh, but also innovation in um, uh, social uh, and, and, and institutions, uh, because we've seen that in this process of rapid uh, transformation, um, and we're pursuing a, a, a very ambitious and rapid transformation in how we use energy and how we seize on the opportunities of a digital world, um, uh, we see the emergence of, of new social uh, uh, and institutional arrangements. So we need to to be mindful and open also for, for these broader processes of innovation. Um, but beyond policies, the report also draws on insights on, on how the social context shapes and can be shaped to drive more cooperative choices. Um, and this ranges from social norms, uh, as I already alluded to, that can change quite rapidly, um, to, to the narratives that often shape uh, economic uh, and political out outcomes um, uh, that in the end can, can also lead to, to changes in what's socially acceptable uh, and what is uh, valued in, in society. And, and social movements um, over the course of history and, and recently have, have been shown to drive this process of, of social change, for example. Um, so, um, to do all of this, uh, and perhaps this is the key takeaway of, of the report, if you don't remember anything that I've said, perhaps the, the key idea to retain, uh, we argue, is that it's crucial uh, to double down on, on human development. Um, uh, doubling down on human development means um, in enhancing people's health and education, uh, and, and this broader notion of well-being associated with human development that goes beyond uh, beyond income. Um, but also, uh, and this is sometimes neglected uh, in, in, the, in the understanding of what human development is and means, giving people more, more autonomy, more agency, and a greater sense of control over their lives. Uh, so um, I think it's, it's very clear that at the moment, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development re re remains our aspiration, our uh, our goal, but advancing human development can, can be uh, uh, the means uh, to navigate this uncertainty complex uh, and bring us back towards a path of progress to, to, to meet uh, the SDGs. Um, so let me stop here. Uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, back to you, Ujo. Uh, thank you so much, Pedro, for giving those, giving us those insights um, into such an important conversation um, that, you know, just the way our world has been shaping over the past couple of years, a lot of changes happening, a lot of uncertainty emerging, but also showing us that, you know, we can actually take the right steps in order to navigate through everything that is unfolding um, before us. So we're going to go into the next session of today's event, which is a panel discussion. Now, before I invite the panelists, I would just like um, everyone to note that we're going to be taking some questions after the panel session. So as we're listening to discussion, if there are things that 
come to your mind, questions that pop up, please feel free to um, note those down. For those that will be participating virtually, we welcome you to use the chat function to put in um, any questions that you may have. And then to everyone who is here in person, um, we do have two microphones at either end of the aisles, which we will welcome you to use um, to direct your questions to any of the panelists or just generally, and we'll try our best to go through um, as many questions as we can. Now, to get started um, on with our panel discussion, I would like to invite um, Eriberto Tapia, who is the Research and Strategic Partnership Advisor at UNDP. Um, where he previously he has served in the executive office of UNDP and in the Economic Commission for Latin American and the Caribbean. He has also worked as a consultant to the IMF, UNDP, and ECLAC. Furthermore, he has been a lecturer at Columbia University, University of Chile, and University Diego Portales. Heriberto holds a PhD in economics from Columbia University, a master's degree in economics, and a commercial engineering degree from the University of Chile. So please join me in welcoming Heriberto as our moderator for today's panel. And to invite uh, our second panelist for today's discussion is Barbara Grantham. She is the president and CEO of CARE Canada. CARE is part of an international confederation working in over 100 countries to realize the power and positive impact of women's leadership in their local communities. Before joining CARE, Barbara has served as president and CEO of VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation. She has held executive positions with BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the Vancouver Foundation, and had a successful consulting practice for many years. So without further ado, please welcome Barbara to the stage. And last, uh, but certainly not the least, uh, we would like to welcome Tini Soni, who is the CEO of AKF India. Tini has over 30 years of experience on sustainable livelihood development in rural India and has worked extensively on issues of agriculture and livestock development for smallholder farmers. She has also worked on strengthening gender perspectives in development and building robust community institutions to lead development processes. She's currently the chief executive of the Aga Khan Foundation India. So please let's give a warm virtual welcome to Tini as well. And our last panelist, which we've already met, uh, is Pedro, who will also be joining this conversation. So now I'll pass it over to Eri to help moderate this, today's conversation. Thank you so much. <coughs> to you. Can you hear me? Okay. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to, to the organizers. <laughs> so in this panel, we're, we're going to be uh, going into some of the, the details of the report. So the first question is actually for, for Pedro. Uh, Pedro discussed uh, this statistic about the very high levels of insecurity in the world, it perceived insecurity. Six out of seven people in the world feel insecure. The levels of insecurities are, are growing in, the, in, the, in most countries with data. So I would like to ask Pedro, uh, what are the implications of this, uh, the fact that this is perceived insecurity? Uh, what is happening with the emotions of people? Why uh, is, is it the case that people in, in, uh, are uh, in, the, in the current context of, of, that we are living are not able to, to process things and, uh, and, 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 and this is producing a, some sort of uh, cognitive dissonance between what they expect and what is happening. Um, how the new advances in psychology can help us to understand this dynamic and why this is important. Over to you, Pedro. Thank you, Ricardo. Well, I think, I think you're right in uh, suggesting that 
um, it's important to look at what drives people's behavior in ways that go beyond assuming that we are all pursuing our, our self-interest, recognizing that is certainly important. And actually, that, that goes for uh, the decisions that, that governments take in, in, the, in the geopolitical context as well. So certainly people pursue their self-interest, governments pursue their self-interest, but there are the things that animate um, people's behavior. Uh, emotions, as you pointed out, uh, but also uh, beliefs. Um, uh, and, and it's important to understand how people come to hold the beliefs they, they do um, and uh, why sometimes different groups have beliefs that are so diametrically opposed. Uh, Robert Putman many years ago um, wrote uh, a book on what he called social capital and he, he drew a distinction between bonding and bridging. Uh, so bonding is what brings uh, groups of people together uh, uh, and it's important, uh, but it's also important to have um, institutions and processes that allow for bridging, uh, even when beliefs uh, across groups of people are, are very diverse. So I, I think it's very important for, for all of us to have this broader understanding um, of, of what drives people's uh, behavior um, and uh, uh, recognize, uh, therefore, as I alluded to, the importance of the social context. Uh, and, and finding ways of intervening and harnessing uh, the social context in ways that um, makes us uh, have a dialogue and, and collaborate with one another, as opposed to uh, having uh, dynamics that pull us apart more and more. Thank you. Barbara, six out of seven people feel insecure. Yeah. Does this resonate with uh, what you see on the ground? Um, well, it certainly resonates with the work that we're doing. Turn it down a little bit. It feels very loud. Or is it just me? Is it good? Okay. Um, it certainly resonates for me, and more importantly, it resonates for the work that we're doing at CARE. But maybe I'll start with a tiny, a little story. Um, in the very kind introduction, they said that I'd previously been the CEO of a, quite a large healthcare foundation in Vancouver, and I finished that job on December 31st of 2019. And I literally walked out of the office with my boxes of stuff, crying because I loved my job and I loved the team and I was leaving on very, very positive terms. And I was going to be starting my role at CARE on April the 1st of 2020. And I had planned this little kind of three month you know, sabbatical holiday for myself. And I made this little list of things that I wanted to do in those three months. I wanted to take my 90-year-old dad on a trip. I wanted to ski on weekdays. I wanted to brush up on my Francais. Uh, I had to find an apartment in Ottawa. All of these things. Clean out my basement. Don't forget that. And I started working my way through that list in January. And then in February, things started to change. And by early March, things had changed very dramatically. And on April the 1st, no joke, I was in my first day on the job. And my image in my mind on that day of December the 31st was that I was going to walk into the office in Ottawa in a new outfit, you know, like the Energizer bunny. And I was sitting in my office in the basement of my house in Vancouver looking at a screen of 120 people who were my new colleagues, most of whom I'd never met in person. And that's kind of what the world has been like ever since that April 1st of 2020. But I guess three things um, come to mind, aside from the highly salient and thoughtful and important um, uh, constellations of thinking that this report has offered us uh, from UNDP. Um, I'll offer three quick thoughts. The first is, I, in that insecurity, I think what the last three years have shown all of us is the degree of interconnection that we have in our daily lives. Whether that's in our relationships, whether that's in our health, whether that's in how we move around, 
but we are far more deeply interconnected in how we work together, how we play together, how we learn, but just how we live on this planet than I think we understood before. That means a different mindset in how we solve our way out of some of these problems. The second is, um, is some of the, the, um, the negative consequences of that insecurity, which Pedro, I think you've, you've articulated so, so elegantly, but I guess my um, observation is that when people feel less secure, their level of trust in the world goes down and the level of trust they have in the things around them. Their, their level of fear goes up and that changes our behavior. And the dominant behaviors in one mode of feeling secure suddenly are less dominant and new dominant behaviors come to the fore. And we see that, we see that in places in the world that move inward, we see that in increasing mistrust. And so for me, the call to action for this work has never been more important as we encourage people to continue to live outward, to understand those interconnections, to articulate them, and to help people figure out how we continue to live together in this very complex time. And I guess my third observation um, that I'm feeling very acutely just this week is we, we really did finish, I think, the end of 22 with a sense, as you so beautifully articulated in the introduction, Khalil, that we are now in this very different time. We are in an uncertain time that was very different at the end of 2019. And the last six weeks have actually given us two very um, meaningful, sad, tragic actually examples of that. One is the um, decision by the de facto authorities in Afghanistan around women's staff, which has deeply impacted us and, and many other NGOs. And the second obviously is the earthquake in Turkey and North Syria. Uh, and like many of our organizations at CARE, we have lost staff who perished um, earlier this week. This level of uncertainty is not going to change for the foreseeable future. And so I think it calls upon us to not uh, give in to that uncertainty, but to be more certain ourselves about what we can do. Because we can do a lot. Thank you. Tini, can you hear us? Yes, I can, and I hope you can hear me as well. We can uh, hear greetings you and well. many warm wishes from India. Nice seeing you. So, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how this new context of uh, uncertainty uh, is experienced from the perspective of India, uh, and in particular, if you see some interrelation with the inequalities in a fast-growing, fast-changing country? Over to you. Um, yes, of course. I mean, I think the last few years, as Barbara and Pedro have also mentioned, have been difficult um, uh, years. Um, uh, we've seen, um, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, women, particularly women in the informal workforce, insecurities for women and young children are much greater. Uh, and when we have uh, a large number of women are in the informal workforce, and we did see during uh, the years of the pandemic how uh, informal workers lost their jobs, and that heightened the insecurity. But I would also like to dwell on Barbara's last point, that perhaps in this this, we should also look at the positive stories that have emerged and which give us the hope that, you know, uh, 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 coming together as a community can really help us overcome these insecurities. So, for example, here, uh, uh, I think there's been a lot of focus now on the environment, that it's a shared environment and together we have to protect uh, uh, the environment. So, I would look upon uh, us also overcoming uh, these insecurities and uh, the difficult times through a lot of positive action, through a lot of 
community action that has taken place. I mean, even in the work that, uh, uh, you know, we have seen on the ground, like uh, at the height of the pandemic, when everything was kind of shut down, we saw how communities came together, set up green banks so that issues of food insecurity would not be there in their communities. We've also seen collective action when communities have come together to actually protect natural resources, revive uh, rivers. So I would also like to say that while uh, uh, the, the report does point out that there is insecurity, I also feel there are many positive stories of action uh, that we can also uh, learn from and in a way replicate and take forward. Thank you, Tini. One of the issues in the, in the report uh, that is very important, one of the layers of uh, uncertainty refers to this uh, Anthropocene reality. So humans are changing the planet in a, in a dangerous way. So, uh, but most of the elements that we know are, are, are pretty limited. And even in the, in the way we talk about, let's say, climate change, uh, it's based on one number, uh, 1 1.5 degrees, etc. So I would like to, to come back to Pedro to, to try to understand how um, we can understand in a better way how this Anthropocene reality is impacting us in a different way. And um, UNDP recently launched a, a new platform, a Human Climate Horizons, and how this platform, uh, in a way, try to respond to this question and what we can learn uh, and what can we expect uh, in the future from this type of initiative. Over to you, Pedro. Thank you, Heriberto. Uh, be before I address your question, I, I just wanted to underline the points that um, Barrantini made, because uh, sometimes people said, uh, well, you're saying your report is about uncertainty, but we are not uncertain. We know many things that need to, to, be, to do, and we are not doing it. Um, and I think that um, the way Barbara put it is, is just perfect. It's, it's precisely because the context around us is so uncertain that we have to be much more certain uh, and decisive in, in taking action. So I just wanted to, to thank uh, Barbara in particular for that uh, important point. Um, now, as, as you said, Heribert, I think that a lot of the discussion that we see about climate change or this broader context of uh, dangerous planetary change um, is framed in a way that doesn't um, look uh, uh, carefully enough about what this implies to people and what is going to imply in people's lives. Um, and so what we've been trying to do in our office uh, as a result of the work that is reflected not only in this but also in the 2020 human development report was to, to to understand what this broader process of dangerous planetary change implies in in people's lives so one of the ways um, in which we are trying to do this is understand the implications for human development and the prospects for human development um, around the world so with this um, human climate horizons, what we've been able to do is to provide hyper-localized information about how climate change is going to uh, be reflected uh, in changes in mortality rates, um, uh, in changes in the ability of people to work, um, and in, in energy consumption, uh, in the demand for energy to uh, adapt to a, to a warming world. Um, and it's an interactive tool, so uh, I would encourage the, the colleagues listening in to, uh, to give it a try. Um, uh, and the, the key highlight for me of, of using this tool is, is that it's, it's just going to exacerbate inequalities in human development, which was something that we looked at in the 2019 Human Development Report. But as a result of climate change, uh, the implications for human development uh, are going to be that the inequalities are going to explode, really. So I think it's an important tool to both help us to understand uh, how to adapt uh, because of the information it provides at the very localized level, but most of all, because of these risks of an explosion of inequalities in human development, I think it's actually a rallying cry for um, um, accelerating action on mitigation as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, Tini, uh, we would like to, to come back to you. 
uh, because we, in, the, in the report we talk about this uh, uncertainty complex where there, the, there are different layers of uncertainty and they impact people in different ways. Uh, we just talk uh, about the differentiated effects of uh, climate change. In the case of India, it's a, it's a very large country, very unequal. How do you see this uh, uh, intersection, this, over, 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 this overlaid uh, 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 uncertainties and, and what is the reality that is emerging? What is changing in India in this, mo in this moment? I mean, uh, the impact of climate change, I think uh, we're really feeling uh, that uh, in the country because that affects, I mean, we've seen uh, over the last year a lot of unseasonal rainfall. Unseasonal rainfall adversely impacts food security. Food security adversely impacts the most vulnerable. Um, and, and that, again, heightens insecurities. So how do you build that adaptation? I think those are questions that we are now trying to address. Um, uh, we've also seen increased uh, rural to urban migration. Sometimes it is, um, you know, aspirational. You want to go to an urban center because of the better facilities or you're better qualified. But many times it is distress uh, migration. And when, uh, 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 you know, people migrate in distress to urban centers, it also breaks the community bonds. So again, it heightens that uh, insecurity. Water is a serious uh, issue. We are seeing a lot of water scarcity, uh, water quality, the impact on water quality, that, is, that also heightens uh, insecurity leads to health uh, issues. So the interlinkages are very much uh, uh, there. The loss of biodiversity, uh, you know, particularly if we look at crops, particularly if we look at livestock, diminishing biodiversity affects livelihoods and again heightens the insecurity. So it, I would say the interconnectedness is all there and therefore our solutions will also have to be interconnected. As we think of solutions to build adaptation, we'll have to remember these interconnectedness that uh, uh, is there across the various uh, uh, interventions. Soil fertility, I mean, uh, we are grappling with that challenge currently. How do we maintain our soils so that they can, can continue to grow the food that our uh, people need? So uh, 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 how do we increase soil fertility? How do we strengthen agriculture nutrition linkages? So I'd say that they're all there, these interconnectedness. Thank you so much. So now we're trying to, uh, to move to, towards the, the action side of things. Um, and I would like to, to start with uh, Barbara. Um, so in the report, we, we emphasize a lot uh, the importance of investment. Uh, why investment? Because Investment is our way to take action today to change something in the future in the direction that we want. Um, could you tell us, uh, from your point of view, what are the key investments that are needed uh, to transform the future in the direction we want? And what would be also standing in in the way of this investment. Uh, so what can we do in this direction? I think um, we've, uh, well, as I, I think all of us are saying, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, we were, in, in the higher resource countries, I think we were uh, very, very fortunate, very blessed to come out of the pandemic in a more socially, financially, economically, um, and culturally, I mean, kind of in the sociological sense, in a more secure situation. But I th I'm not sure, uh, with all due respect, most of us living in, in this part of the world really have a sense of the fragility of much of the world that still remains. Because of the interconnection of these things, these four C's, I think, that have come up several times already, as, as a couple of our colleagues referred to yesterday, the four C's being conflict, COVID, climate, and now cost. And that's where we have to focus the, the investment, but it can't be investment that's uh, siloed. We have to recognize the interdependency of those four things, because if we make um, kind of one-off or uh, segmented investments that don't recognize that interdependency, 
then I think we're, we're not going to make the kind of social human development progress that we need to see. So as an example, we, um, we saw tragically in, in the lockdown uh, eras of the, con of the, of the, of the uh, pandemic, the consequences for, particularly for women, who uh, informal workers, that was their sole source of support. And those lockdowns prevented them from being able to earn the living they need on a daily basis in order to be able to feed their children. It uh, prevented them from being able to literally obtain the food in order to feed their families. That lack of net, of a, of a net, um, of food, of health, of safety, of well-being has had tragic consequences around the world. And so we have to look at integrated responses in terms of those investments that give women that combination of health, learning and education, agency and autonomy, as Pedro so accurately said, or what what I would call a dignified livelihood um, in a way that's sustainable going forward. That, that, that sounds like a lot of complicated words coming out of my mouth, but it literally means giving that woman the ability to grow some food in her village so that she can feed her children and maybe some more people in a way that helps that village to build out a sense of agency and autonomy and community for itself. And that builds those positive interconnections rather than the negative ones. Thank you. Dini, uh, from your perspective, uh, what are the type of investments that are critically needed in the context of India? And in particular, uh, do you see uh, that uh, we need to generate uh, a, a, dif a different uh, cultural context in order to make uh, those investments feasible? I think an investment in empowering communities to really understand what is happening uh, uh, with their environment and also to support them to come up with solutions which they would then own and then implement. So I think that uh, would perhaps be uh, an investment that I would think was really required. Investing in empowering, as Pedro said, giving people the agency to really um, uh, analyze their own communities, their own situations and come up with the solutions and support them then to implement uh, those solutions. So I would say a ground up process to build adaptation to the climate change that we are uh, seeing. Uh, mitigation strategies, but also adaptation and resilience uh, strategies in the face of this rapidly changing uh, environment. Uh, I mean, there are numerous positive stories of communities coming together, um, you know, that we have seen even in the years of the uh, pandemic. And I think those have given us immense hope when communities have come together and taken action and uh, improved the situation for themselves and their community. So I think that would give us, uh, a, a, you know, a pathway to take forward. Uh, I think COVID has also taught us the significance and the importance of following a One Health approach. And I think that is uh, essential as we think forward uh, uh, strategies, um, how the linkages between the environment, the livestock that we maintain and uh, our own health, how much that is interconnected. Pedro spoke about the zoonotic diseases. That is a reality. COVID was perhaps the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the most recent zoonotic disease that we all uh, uh, faced. So how how do we actually ensure that our environments are healthy, the livestock that we keep are healthy, and uh, our own health is therefore impacted? So I would say looking at uh, uh, solutions through a One Health uh, lens would also be something uh, you know that we could uh, think of. So I would put a lot of focus on the empowerment of communities, on strategies from the grassroots upwards, for policies to be much more attuned to community needs. Uh, I would put those things up front. Thank you, Tini. Uh, the second uh, pillar of the, of the strategy that the report is uh, proposing is uh, in, uh, insurance. So Pedro, could you tell us uh, what's the meaning of insurance in this context? And in particular, um, what are the potential limitations that certain forms of insurance have like private insurance and how this could be addressed 
and what are the other forms of insurance that we need to take into account? Sure, Roberto. I, I think that the, the report, when we use the word insurance, uh, it means um, also taking action to reduce vulnerability to, uh, to risks and, and to shocks. So it's not only about making sure that there is uh, compensation in, in, in the case of an adverse event or shock, uh, but also making sure that we are better prepared. And it's very hard for some reason for humans to uh, to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for us, it's, it's easy for us to respond uh, when there is evidence of, of, of a shock, as we're seeing now in the tragedy in, in Turkey and, and uh, northern Syria uh, with the earthquake. We are compelled to, to help the, the people that are, that are suffering. Um, but uh, we'll find out more about uh, what, what's happening over time, but uh, certainly some of the um, uh, implications of, of the earthquake have to do with the, the lack of, of preparedness and investment, for instance, in, in building um, uh, according to uh, even the existing codes uh, that would make um, uh, collapse of buildings less, less likely. Uh, and that's why often there is this uh, reaction in colleagues that work in this field not to use the, the word natural disaster because there's nothing natural about these disasters. These disasters are uh, a consequence of human choices uh, or, or of the choices that we make, certainly um, uh, in the implications they have often for the more vulnerable people. So the, the report is trying to, to make the case that it's important for us to look at um, uh, insurance in this broader in this broader sense about how do we prepare um, for a more volatile world and I, I worry sometimes that uh, we look at um, isolated events as one-off like like COVID-19 and we have these narratives and, and expressions of build back better as if we're never going to have a, a zoonotic disease ever again um, but uh, and it may be a long time until until we do uh, hopefully uh, but it's not the most likely uh, scenario because of this broader process of dangerous planetary change. So it's about expanding market insurance. Why? Because if you look at uh, 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 losses that are covered by market insurance today in high income countries, about 50% of these are covered by market insurance. But in low and, mid and middle income countries, only 10% of losses are covered by, by market insurance. And if you look at the social insurance side, uh, social insurance now um, um, absorbs uh, about 20% of, of the economies of high income countries. 20% of the GDP of high income countries on average is devoted to social insurance. Again, if you go to high, uh, sorry, to low and middle income countries, you see that this is five or 6% only. Um, so there are huge gaps here, both on market insurance and on social insurance that need to be filled. Um, for us to be able to navigate this, uh, this volatile world. Thank you, Pedro. Another element uh, of insurance has to do with the protection of uh, our diversity, that the different groups have uh, voices, have agency. Barbara, uh, how do you think uh, we can make sure that we uh, can protect those voices and fight discrimination um, these are, uh, in many cases, things that do not uh, take a lot of money to achieve. It, it requires a, another type of approach. What's your view? Yeah. Well, that's the Pandora's box, isn't it? Um, I'll maybe, um, well, I'll step outside the box. Because <laughs> I think a um, couple things. We've, we, we, uh, what I will call carefully and respectfully the aid industry, the, the model needs to be upended. And I think COVID showed us that in a very powerful and uh, visceral way. Um, and there's lots of terms that, that the industry, the movement has used for years, decolonization, localization, probably being the two, the two most um, frequent terms, but if ever there was uh, an instance in which we saw uh, that the capabilities of Global North-based 
development and humanitarian organizations have limited ability when those very fragile bonds are torn apart or so severely stressed as they were. This was that moment of demonstration that maybe all of us needed to see. More importantly, I think we're now hearing loudly, eloquently, frequently, powerfully from our colleagues in the Global South that this is the time. This is the time for change. And the model really has to be upended. And that is our challenge and that is our opportunity. Um, because I don't think there's, there's going back. Um, CARE is one of the signatories to the Pledge for Change, along with PLAN, Oxfam, Save the Children, a number of others, that calls for a fairly dramatical redraw of how this work is done over the next 10 to 20 years. And we're making small, incremental, but important steps on that front. Uh, more and more of the resources that we procure here in Canada, for example, leave this country and less stays, sticks, if I can put it that way, with us at Care Canada. That will accelerate and that will change the kind of operation that we are here in Canada. And more importantly, that will put the resources where they're really intended to be and where they can unleash for our uh, capability of human potential. So that'll be my first point. The second point, I think, is the sector in the main has relied on two uh, revenue sources. Institutional funders, who've in the main been generous and fair and um, reasonable over the years. And secondly, what we call philanthropy fundraising, which is important, uh, meaningful, uh, salient. We've, less, we've had less engagement with the private sector. And there've been lots of debates about that. And I'm happy to debate that with anybody, anytime. But when we did some work at CARE a few years ago, we really looked at what's it going to take in terms of investment to bring about a more equal world in which women are at the table in the communities where they live is so that they're safe, they're healthy, and they have a dignified livelihood so that they can be that leader and make that community a better place because every human indicator tells us that that's the case. And if we don't bring the, private, the resources of the private sector into the conversation, we're leaving a whole segment of the world out of the possibilities that that presents for us. And I guess the, the, the lesson maybe out of COVID, ironically, is that now, I would argue the private sector needs us just as much as we need them. That's a different kind of conversation that we're not very uh, nimble yet at having, but that's where I see huge potential for us to unleash human progress. Thank you, Barbara. We have just a few minutes, so we're, uh, but I want to touch the, the issue of uh, innovation which is the third pillar. So I will ask our, all our panelists to, to give us a 30 second, one minute reflection about the areas where they see we need to innovate or how do, do they see uh, innovation going forward, the importance of it. So I'm gonna start with uh, Timmy. Um, so I'd say uh, innovation in technologies uh, to address issues of climate change, innovation in seed varieties. I mean, that's an area uh, of significant interest. Uh, seed varieties that are more uh, drought resistant, um, uh, you know, more get more uh, yield so that we can actually address issues of food insecurity. Um, uh, so I think these would be uh, some of the areas of innovation, low cost innovations uh, as well. The whole space of renewable energy, while we've seen immense advancement, I think much more needs to be uh, done so that we can actually replace, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, fossil fuel usage completely. So I'd say even innovations in the renewable energy uh, space. Um, so I think these would be some of the areas that I would, uh, uh, you know, think of upfront where innovation should uh, prior be prioritized. Thank you, Tini. Pedro. I, 
I agree with Dini. I, I would just emphasize again the importance of us being open to social innovation as well and institutional innovation. Uh, I think that if we are um, serious about pursuing the, the very fundamental transformations uh, that we are um, all committed to uh, in the energy transition into a digital world, we will need to be open to uh, create new institutions, new social arrangements that would enable us to uh, do this transformation and enable it to happen with the uh, um, the least social and economic dislocation. Thank you. Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the wisdom of Tinny or Pedro, so let me finish with a quick story. In the summer of 2018, I was in Karachi. Uh, I was a guest of the Aga Khan University, and uh, we went to visit a, a health project, research project that was a partnership between AKU uh, and the Gates Foundation and, and another funder. And we went to this uh, very, very poor, um, high, high density peri urban area outside of the heart of Karachi, where this research project was taking place. And it was essentially a, um, what we would call a suburb, but I, I can't describe how, how high, high density this area was. Extremely high infant mortality rates, every indicator. Uh, in, in, in the UNDP's world was, was, was not, not positive. And this was before the pandemic. And we walked into this clinic where they were, that was one of the sites of the project. It was a pediatric health clinic. And there were women physicians, nurses, healthcare providers, seeing women and their children. And they had trained other women who live in the community to be community health workers. And those women were responsible for going around and checking on a certain track of families every day to check on the health of the babies, the children, the mothers, and so on. And I walked in, and I'm not sure what I expected, but what I saw was every single one of those community health workers was walking through the neighborhood either with a small iPad or her phone entering data for every single household. How many children? How much did they weigh today? Are they eating properly? Is the mother latching on for her breastfeeding? And they were tracking that data every single day. Dozens of these community health workers. And then they came back and I walked into the back room behind the clinic area and there was a small, very small room, third the size of this stage. And there were two researchers there from the university and all of the data had been uploaded into their computers and they were aggregating all of this data on a daily basis to track the vulnerable households in that neighborhood. So we talk about innovation, I think at a very macro level, and sometimes we need to remember that those really micro examples can be very powerful for social change and improvement. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, this is very important that uh, to have stories because uh, stories is the way we make sense of, uh, of the world. Um, so I think we need more of these stories. So this is, this is a wonderful way to end this panel. So I think we, we should give a, an applause to all to our panelists. Over to you. Thank you once again to all of our panelists for engaging in such uh, an enlightening and a uh, very important conversation with everyone here today. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be going into uh, a Q&A session. So if you have questions that are brewing up, you know, as the conversation was going on, please get ready to, um, to ask them to direct your questions. Both those who are joining us online can do so in the chat and everyone who is also here in person can also do so um, with the microphones that are available. Now, before we get into the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to invite everyone um, to use your mobile device or another digital device. Um, we're going to go into a very lighthearted, but just to get inside of where everyone is at in terms of the conversation that we're having today, we're going to go into Slido. So um, if you can use the link that has been put in the chat or um, 
if you have your device, you can scan the QR code um, and just go into slido.com and the participant code is shown on the screen. It's 36138358. So we just welcome everyone to go into slido.com to uh, join this um, mini interactive session that we have. Okay, I think we can just get started with the first question. So um, it says, on a scale of one to 10, do you feel your day-to-day -day living was disrupted by global uncertainties before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic? So you can just respond um, based on what you feel your experience was. Um, I see most people are, at least most people that have answered are sitting on a level two, um, nothing really more than a level eight per se. I see threes and fives are going up. Okay, the numbers, uh, I like the way the numbers are, <laughs> are fluctuating, <laughs> going up and down. So yeah, it's really great to, to see everyone's um, perspective. So yeah, just feel free to um, answer in a, in a way that you feel is representative of your experiences, of your background, of your um, of the environment that you've been in. Yeah, so I think most people are sort of like between level two to level six, um, not really feeling too disrupted in their day-to-day -day living. Uh, so we can go to the next question. So it says, now, what is your current feeling of insecurity on a scale of one to 10? based on everything that's happening around you. Um, I see that number eight went up really quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we can, to some extent, agree that things have changed and shifted, um, you know, in the past couple of years, not just on a global level, but also individually, like our day-to-day, -day, our lived experiences um, have really been shifted. And I think most of the responses that are coming in are, are indicative of that. Um, and then we can go on to the next question. So it says, do you feel confident that as a society, we will find ways to navigate through the emerging uncertainties? Are you confident in humanity? <laughs> are you confident in yourself as well? Um, so yes, no, maybe you're just unsure like, you know, I have no idea. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You know, how confident uh, I see. At least for most of us that are here, we have faith to some extent. So that's good. That's good that we're putting faith in ourselves. That's that's good to see. Um, and I think uh, we are seeing certain positive signs that we will be able to, you know, move through the different ebbs and flows. And I think, like Pedro mentioned, we really need to double down. Um, on human development. And just going on to our last question for today. So now we're asking, what brings you hope as we navigate uncertainty in human development? So now you can type in whatever it is that you feel um, brings you hope, whether that's a place, a person, a thing, an invention, a community, an organization, like whatever it is, what do you feel brings you hope um, as we navigate uncertainty in human development? So I see youth, human connection, the next generation. So I see a lot of emphasis on, you know, generations to come, the younger generation, a lot of connection. Uh, I think community came in, faith, um, innovation as well. Um, I can't really see, okay, I think I can see from this angle. Um, human ingenuity, a lot of resilience, people care, humor, I like that. <laughs> Better communication, our children, empowering women, relationships. Um, but we still see that, you know, from our responses, connection, faith, innovation, and, you know, really an emphasis on the youth and the next generation 
um, has really been highlighted. So uh, thank you so much and thank you everyone for sharing your insights with us. And I hope that we can all continue to cling onto this hope as things continue to unfold. Um, as we continue to navigate through the uncertainties that may uh, unfold even in the years to come. So now just coming back to the floor and uh, there was a question that did come up um, online that I'm going to share. And I think this was in relation to what Pedro uh, mentioned earlier about um, we need to have a certain level of certainty amidst uncertainty. So the question here says, how can we be certain when we are in context of polarized thinking and models? And I think I could direct this to Pedro. Um, how do we develop this sense of certainty that you were uh, that you anchored on in your in your responses earlier when we are in such a polarized context and such polarized ways of thinking and, and, and models? Um, Pedro? Thanks, Uju. Uh, very good question. So uh, again, I think it's important for us to find uh, ways of bridging different different sets of, of beliefs uh, and ways in which they are not seen as necessarily opposing, or even if they are superficially seen as opposing, uh, being opposed to one another, finding points of, of convergence. Um, so just to give an example, um, there might be uh, uh, different reasons as to why people think it's a good idea to protect the environment, for instance. One could be motivated by the belief in science uh, and uh, um, looking at the scientific evidence that tells us uh, what we're doing to our planet. Um, so that could be a set of beliefs that motivates action. Another set of beliefs could be religious, um, uh, that we should not uh, harm um, um, divine creation. Uh, another set of beliefs could be informed by uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, so I think it's important to, to find ways of, of finding points of, of convergence and, and uh, agreement, uh, even if the sets of beliefs may, may be um, um, coming from different uh, epistemic realities. So I think this is one of the challenges that we confront is finding these points of convergence and how do we do is bridging uh, between uh, uh, different sets of beliefs. All right, thank you. Um, we do have another question that has come in um, in our online chat. So the question, uh, I guess sort of asking the moderator to help facilitate this, but what sort of the person is asking, can panelists suggest one specific high leverage activity that community capacity builders can undertake at the local level to support the report's recommendation. So I'll take that again. Can the panelists suggest one specific high leverage activity that community capacity builders can undertake at the local level to support the report's recommendations? Um, and I don't know if anybody would like to jump in there uh, specifically, or maybe I can start with Tini since you're smiling. <laughs> so maybe we can start with you. No, uh, no, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bashir, for that. So I think from our perspective, say here in India, perhaps investing in um, uh, supporting communities to understand the changes that they're going through and come up with collective actions, given that, you know, the resources that they have and the community is so much, uh, uh, you know, interconnected that way. So I would say investing that communities can plan develop community plans and then support them to act on those community plans. I mean, that would build the bonds that, you know, would help overcome this heightened sense of insecurity. It would also help protect the environment. It would also help to regenerate resources that we all depend on. So I would put it, uh, uh, perhaps that could help us leverage uh, and act on the report's recommendations. Okay, thank you. And I think I would just take one last uh, response from Barbara. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I wrote down four, but I have to pick one. So I'm going to cheat and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine them. And I'm going to say um, at the local level is a really good question. One specific high leverage activity. And I would say invest in young women, mm. whether it's in her education, 
in her sexual and reproductive health and her awareness of her rights around her sexual reproductive health or and or giving her the tools whether it's seeds or membership in a, in a savings and loan association in her neighborhood or whatever, but the tools to earn a dignified livelihood. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think this would be the last call to uh, those who are in person. If there are any questions uh, in the room? If not, then yes, just, okay, come, you can come to the microphone. Yes, please. Um, this is actually directed at Barbara, but I'd be happy to hear any other responses as well. Sorry, Barbara. Um, <laughs> you mentioned the opportunity with um, engaging in the private sector, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that, dig in a little bit deeper, and maybe if you have any examples of what that could look like. Sure. Um, it's a bit of a hobby horse, so I'm going to try not to climb on it. Um, I'll give you a couple. Of, I'll give you one example. Um, we've, well, I'll give you two. We've got in this country um, a large number uh, of companies in the extractive industry that work in global presences, right? Mining, oil and gas, energy, uh, and so on. And increasingly, those companies are being called upon to uh, bring a more resilient approach to their social license to operate in those contexts. And that, that broadly, we call it now ESG. And so they're being asked to report and prove their worth in those communities, um, whether it's around things like, uh, to what degree is it a safe community? To what degree is the community better because of the presence of that company in terms of the education of the children, the health status of the population, and so on. And that requires them knowing how to measure some of those things. That's what we do. That's what we do all the time, all over the world, through all of the projects that we do. And some of those companies are, sorry, I'm trying to look at the way, and you, uh, some of those companies are going out and hiring uh, big consulting firms with initials in their names. Um, and then they're subcontracting to organizations like us. And we know how to do that work. And so it's actually taking the work that we already do for our friends down the road. We monetize our intellectual capital to them, essentially, and redeploy it in other parts of the world. That The same fundamental premise is the same. We're monetizing the intellectual capital that we have for a different investor. So that'll be my first example. I'll give you a second example, and this is one that our friends at Care USA are already doing with a very well-known global food company that is required by its shareholders, its customers, its employees, um, to show the, glo the gender equity across its supply chain globally. And they've hired CARE to help them do that work because CARE has presence in 110 countries around the world, all of the countries in which this company happens to operate, and they can bring local presence in country uh, with coordination through CARE USA to help that food company do that work. So those are a couple of examples. I think we just have to be much more open to, to, as I said, kind of shaping the work that we're already doing and the expertise that we already have and rethinking the value proposition for a different investor. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to encourage everyone that is also here in person. After the session is over, uh, we encourage everyone to stay around, mingle. So any further questions that you have, please utilize uh, the space, the refreshments, uh, the time to continue to network um, amongst ourselves, to continue to drive these conversations further. And then just to wrap up for today, I would like to invite Kate Higgins to give us the closing remarks. Well, thank you so much. And let us thank the panelists again with a round of applause. Um, it was a really excellent session. So I would like to close by wishing everyone happy International Development Week. Uh, it's International Development Week where we here in Canada are celebrating the incredible contributions of 
people living in Canada, Canadian organizations to a more just, a more sustainable and a fairer world. So we are meeting in this most incredible building, uh, in this most incredible location to connect on trends in global development. And across the country, people are meeting in libraries, in cinemas, at hockey games, when in schools, in universities, to, to, to talk about, to celebrate, to imagine, to collaborate on how Canada and people living in Canada can make a really strong and bold contribution to this world. I would really like to thank UNDP for this excellent report. I am a huge fan of the UNDP uh, uh, Human Development Report, so I'm just so thrilled that we have brought it back to Ottawa for this discussion. Um, I think one of the things that us at Cooperation Canada are seeking to do is to work with our almost 100 members here in Canada, but work with other partners here in Canada and around the world to think through what does the future hold and what is the role for those of us uh, who engage in international assistance, in humanitarian assistance, what is our role and how do we prepare ourselves to make the best contribution we can uh, in a very uncertain, complex, fast-changing world. So I'm thrilled that we've had the opportunity to spend time together this morning to, to think about that, to think about that uncertainty, to think about how we can take certain action <laughs> in a uncertain and complex world and, and what our role should be. Finally, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Aga Khan Foundation of Canada, to Khalil, to the team here at the Aga Khan Foundation of Canada for putting on this wonderful event for us and for opening this most incredible physical but virtual space for us all. We're thrilled to be partnering with you and, and really thank you for this partnership. So with that, I wish you all a wonderful day. I wish you again a happy International Development Week and uh, thank you all for joining us in person or virtually. Thanks. And then just to wrap up for today, um, we would just like to uh, get everyone's feedback as to how today's session went. Um, so in the chat, we'll be putting in a link where you can respond to a post-event survey. We would like to hear from you, like to hear uh, what worked, what didn't work, what type of conversations uh, you would like to have. And then also in person, um, the QR code should be coming up on the screen shortly. So uh, please feel free to, you know, bring out your devices, scan the QR code. We've also um, left the code outside on the table as well. So as you're getting your refreshments, uh, just take a quick snap before you grab your refreshments. So we just like to hear from you. And if you're not already subscribed to our events list, we invite you to do so, so that you stay connected with um, everything that we're doing here. And on behalf of Corporation Canada and Aga Khan Foundation Canada, we'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who joined us both in person and online.